All right. Well, why don't we go ahead and get started? It's a few minutes after the hour. So everyone, welcome. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Today, we are going to hear from Mayura Balakrishnan, who is a fifth-year graduate student at the University of Michigan. She's working with Leah Corrales. And during her first two years, she conducted spectral and timing analyses of black hole X-ray binaries using data from SWIFT, Chandra, NICER, and XMM. More recently, she's been working on understanding the accretion flow of Sagittarius A-star, combining high-resolution Chandra spectroscopy and wolf ray wind simulations. She's currently using signal separation techniques on the galactic center region to separate overlapping components. And she is passionate about outreach involving young and future scientists and has been teaching high school students in the US and in Malaysia. When she's not working, Mayura enjoys spending time reading, doing puzzles, baking, or making colorful pasta. Not many people can say that it's colorful pasta that they like making. So I enjoyed that on your bio, Mayura. Anyway, please take it away. Thank you so much for having me and for the Athena Community Office for, for um, reaching out to me to give this presentation today. I'm excited to share with you the work that we've been doing recently with SAG STARS accretion flow and x-rays. And hopefully you'll take away some nuggets about some science questions about what we can probe further with New Athena in the Galactic Center and how that'll tell us more about SAG STAR and its surroundings. Um, I'm going to begin with an introduction to Sag A star and supernova remnant Sagittarius A east, which I'll talk more about later in the talk. The Galactic Center, I think, is a very cool region. It's a multi-phase dynamic environment. There's lots of different kinds of gas. There's hot gas, cold, ionized, neutral, all sorts of plasma structures in close proximity that interact with each other. And that gives rise to a lot of unanswered astrophysical questions. Um, I'll talk about our work previously this year that was published on the Sag star accretion flow, and that's using results from Chandra high-resolution spectroscopy. And I'll mention how New Athena is actually required to discern between the two major plasma scenarios there. I'll end briefly talking about some of the Chandra imaging work that I'm doing, where um, I'm looking at Sagittarius A East, the supernova remnant nearby, and how better understanding of Sag A East will give us better insight into stellar evolution in extreme environments. I think Sag A star and the Galactic Center are cool because it's a very interesting place and very dynamic place, but to just briefly motivate broader implications, um, we know that you've probably seen this many times, but supermassive black holes and galaxies co-evolve. Uh, supermassive black hole parameters tend to correlate with their host galaxy parameters, which implies that the two influence each other as they grow over cosmic time. Specifically, uh, stellar feedback and supermassive black hole feedback are the two main ways by which galaxies can eject material out of the plane into the CGM, where it reacts with gas there and some eventually condenses and is accreted back into the galaxy. And this cycle of gas leaving and gas getting accreted, all of that affects um, the amount of material in the galaxy for star formation, and it changes the conditions of the gas and the chemical composition of the gas and the chemistry in your galactic nucleus. And these large-scale processes can trickle down into smaller uh, local extreme properties. So the large-scale processes of accretion and outflows, like the Erosita bubbles, all of those things are directly tied to local properties of molecular clouds, which in terms of the turbulence, magnetic field, the chemistry, and the, the uh, chemistry in molecular clouds determines the kind of stars that are made. The stars that are made determine the kind of planets that we get and the types of stars we get also determine how much material is there for Sag A to feed from. And all of this is a cycle. And so I took this slide from Ashley Barnes' presentation uh, last year at the Galactic Center workshop because it was just a nice way to put together that the Galactic Center really is this ecosystem. So what I'm gonna be focusing on in this talk is the central like arc minutes of our galaxy. Uh, this is a very simple schematic on the left here of the Sag A complex where we've got Sag A star, um, like here, we've got this mini spiral structure, Sag A West, 
San Jay West is an ionized structure of gas. And then there's the circumnuclear disk around San Jay star and the circumnuclear disk. Here's our pointer. The circumnuclear disk is about 1.5 to 3 parsecs away from San Jay star. And it's made of cold and dense gas. And enveloping this entire area, um, at least spatially from our point of view, is supernova remnant Sag A East. It is not super clear if Sag A East is uh, fully behind this whole uh, system of Sag A Star, Sag A West, and the circumnuclear disk. But all of these structures are very much close together, even if Sag A East is behind it, it's a few parsecs behind it. Um, uh, in the middle, we have the VLA image from Jawa 2016, where you can see the shell of Sagae East and the mini spiral. On the top left are H2 regions as well nearby. And if you look in the 8.6 micron uh, wavelengths, you get this beautiful, beautiful zoom in on the mini spiral where you can see all sorts of detail. You can see the northern and eastern arms. And this is just to show you that different wavelengths probe very different things in this area. And of course, you might imagine correctly that the x-rays aren't as detailed. In fact, when we look at x-rays, we have a nice blob. And so this is uh, an image I made from 1.5 megaseconds of stacked Chandra data. And as you can see, it's not super clear what's happening. So the cyan lines here are from uh, contours of the radio, from, are from radio contours. And Sagittarius East is somewhere here, mm -hmm. and Sagittarius Star is in here. I'll talk a bit more about Sagittarius East later uh, to just reiterate my point about things being crowded. So this is the same Chandra image. If you zoom in a little bit, you can see that there's now two main point sources, uh, Sagittarius Star, and Pulsar Wind Nebula um, G359.95. And here, this inset is from Wang et al. 2013. The dotted line, the dashed lines indicate uh, the bond radius in which material is gravitationally bound to the supermassive black hole. And there are a couple of things to note here. One is mainly analysis of Sag star's accretion flow in X-rays is difficult because there's so many contaminating objects nearby. Here you can see that there is like diffuse emission all over. Um, the other thing to note is that the 4.1 million solar mass black hole is as bright as the pulsar wind nebula next to it. Sag A star is really, really dim. It is the lowest Eddington luminosity black hole we've ever observed at 10 to the negative 10 Eddington luminosities. And um, it makes it a bit complicated because any time a transit goes off near the galactic center, if it's in your field of view, it will completely wash out Sag A star. It is I, uh, classified as kind of like a low luminosity AGN, which is type of AGN that we've seen in several other galaxies as well. And so better understanding of Sag A star's accretion also helps us understand how we have um, low luminosity AGN that seem to be on the off phase of their like quiescent versus active um, phase cycle. Uh, Sag A star hasn't always been so dim. Recent studies or several studies have argued that Sag A star was more active in the past. Um, there are several uh, papers on looking at the iron K alpha fluorescence in molecular clouds nearby and even in the CND. Um, polarization measurements from last year indicate that Sag A star was present was more um, was outbursting as recently as 200 years ago, and so that's an example of Sag A star directly influencing its surroundings. Could it have energized all the nearby molecular clouds and triggered star formation? Whatever um, in whatever way that Sag A star has uh, affected its surroundings, it's very much directly injected energy and changed the way that the galactic nucleus was. Um, the other complication is that everywhere in this region, there's stars. Uh, one of the, there, there are many, many fun, weird things about the Galactic Center. Um, but so here is a, a, another schematic where they've identified the this dotted area here is the nuclear star cluster. And on the right is 
a region slightly smaller than the nuclear star cluster, but you can see the number of stars in this area. There's just stars everywhere. So you have your supermassive black hole, you have your mini spiral structure and the CND and the supernova remnant and everywhere in your field, there's just lots and lots and lots of stars. And some of those stars are really young stars. Specifically, um, the, the stars closest to Sagittarius star are referred to as the S cluster. S2 in particular comes within like hundreds of AU of Sagittarius star. So super, super close to Sagittarius star, the, the orbits as you can see are more chaotic. As it zooms out, you'll see that there's more that fall into like a disk structure. Um, there's in fact disks that are stars in a counterclockwise disk and a counterclock, a counter, ah, I'm sorry, stars going in a clockwise disk and counterclockwise disk all in the same area. And so the, the orbits of the stars here are definitely not well understood. But from these stars, we know that a lot of them are very young, massive stars, and about 20 to 30 of them are wolf ray stars. And those are uh, some labeled here in this plot from Jorge Quadra's paper. And hydrodynamical simulations of the stellar winds from the wolf ray stars have been used for a number of things. One thing is you can measure the expected mass accretion rate, uh, the expected amount of plasma within the Bondi radius. And so within Sag A star's Bondi radius, um, Bondi accretion should be about 10 to negative five solar masses per year. I'm talking about all these young stars and one of the big uh, mysteries and confusing things in the galactic center is why there are all of these young stars so close to Sag A star. Um, S2 is within the tidal radius of the supermassive black hole and is entirely unclear how these stars form so, so close to Sag A star. People are looking at dusty objects nearby to try and find young stars and um, all of those things. And I'll talk a bit later, but this connects to Sag A East. So I mentioned that the Bondi accretion rate is about 10 to the negative five solar masses per year. So this is the X-ray image from earlier. And um, this is at about 10 to the five gravitational radii. And if we zoom in a little bit to about a hundred gravitational radii, polarization measurements tell us that the mass accretion rate is 10 to the negative eight solar masses per year. And of course, if you zoom in all the way, you get the beautiful EHT images where you're at like 12 gravitational radii, and that mass accretion rate is not well constrained. But in this regime here, mass just doesn't make it all the way in. Something is happening within this accretion flow such that mass that should be able to go all the way in and be radiated does not. There are lots of different models, of course, to try and explain this. There's lots of different physics involved in inefficient accretion flows. One is the ADAF, the advection-dominated accretion flow. Um, this is an ADAF plus JET model here from Yuan et al. 2002. And there's lots of different kinds of physics that people can talk about, but overall, these quasi-spherical flows can be parametrized with the REAF prescription. So REAF stands for radiatively inefficient accretion flow, and that's just a way of describing a uh, plasma. It has nothing to do with the inner physics of the plasma. It's just describing the plasma. And so in the REAF paradigm, we've got mass accretion rate, tens density, and temperature, and these S and Q parameters. And here, S is zero corresponds to Bondi accretion, and S is one corresponds to equal amounts of material going in as going out. So the zeroth order Chandra spectrum, the what I'll talk about that we've done this year is the first order spectrum. The zeroth order spectrum has been fit with the REAF model, and S is about one. And so that tells us that inflow is approximately equal to the outflow at this 10 to the five gravitational radii near the Bondi radius. Ma et al. from 2019 looked at the multi-wavelength SED, not just the X-ray, uh, not just the X-ray SED, and found that S was approximately 0.6. So basically that there is a big outflow component towards the Bondi radius. Interestingly, um, you can also use stellar wind simulations to fit the Chandra zeroth order spectrum. So I mentioned the hydrodynamical simulations of the wolf ray stars. And so the wolf ray stars are very massive, are throwing off lots of stellar winds. 
that plasma collides with each other because everything's so close together and shocks and you get the shocked plasma that very much radiates in x-rays. And so Chris Russell in 2017, he generated the expected x-ray emission from the hydrodynamical simulations and found that you can very well recreate the zeroth order spectrum, which is really cool because the hydrodynamical simulations only take as input infrared orbits of the stars. And then you do a bunch of stuff, you get the x-ray emission and it matches. Another cool thing recently is possible evidence of a 10 to the 4K disk, uh, H30 alpha disk. So Lena Marchakova's paper in 2019 suggested that there could be an H30 alpha disk, a very, very compact disk in the hot accretion flow. Um, and so simulations have tried to recreate the disk. And so my collaborators, um, Diego Calderon, Jorge Cuadra, and Chris Russell have all been working on one class of simulations. There's another class of simulations um, by Sean Ressler, and those don't produce the disk. And we have at least figured out that the disk forms under certain conditions in the simulation. Um, and that's a paper we're working on that Diego is working on right now. But the point is that um, when you have these hydrodynamic simulations and they're running, when you have a disk within the hot accretion flow, it actually increases the mass accretion rate overall. It allows um, it allows plasma to cool faster, basically. And so differences in the mass accretion rate result in differences in density and temperature. And so one of the questions we were asking in our papers from earlier this year is, we know we can't see the disk in x-rays, it's at 10 to the 4K, but maybe the kinematics of the gas is altered enough that we can probe it with the Chandra spectrum. Which brings me to a very brief intro to Chandra. Um, we used the uh, X-ray Visionary Program data set, which was three megaseconds obtained in 2012. So this is the HEG, MEG. So this is what happens when you have the X-ray gratings on with Chandra. It disperses photons in an X-shaped pattern depending on their energy there in the HEG or the MEG. The point here is that it disperses photons into this X pattern and those photons land directly on the CCD. And so, when you have something with high background, like the galactic center, it makes it very complicated to properly extract the spectrum. Um, so uh, these images that were made and these images that are with ACES S and ACES I, um, the ACES S images technically have the X on there, but you can't see anything because it's so, um, there's a high background and SAJ stars an extended source and has nearby sources as well. So extracting the high resolution spectrum for SAJ star is a very lengthy process. And so that's what my advisor, Leah Corrales did in her paper in 2020, she just extracted the spectrum and she had to do lots of different small things. Um, she removed point sources and chose background um, at different, different backgrounds for different role angles to limit contamination. And uh, this is just an example of one roll angle where you have SAJ star here, and then the background for that roll angle chosen would be opposite from the pulsar wind nebula. And um, when you take the source minus the background, this was the spectrum, this is from her paper. In black is the Chandra high resolution spectrum. In red is the REAF model fit from the zeroth order spectrum. And you can see that the REAF fit is broader because it's for the zeroth order, not the first order. And basically, um, oh, there we go. Um, our science question was, can the first order spectrum contain any signatures of a temperature velocity structure or is the line structure here due to background and um, extraction procedures? We were also wondering if a more detailed REAF model would allow us to constrain better S and Q. Very briefly, what I did to generate the predicted Chandra spectra was, um, so we had our two models, either simulating REAF emission uh, with uh, pi atom dB or the hydrodynamical simulations for the stellar winds. We then took into account lots of details about the ATTGS, uh, the gratings. And we of course took into account extinction with the ISM, which is very high in the galactic center. We convolved it with the instrument response and then we fit models to data. 
So the REAF model, the benefit here, or the point of the REAF model is that that gives us an idea of the inflow outflow balance at this radius. Whereas the stellar wind models, the simulations incorporate very realistic velocity variations based on real stars and their real orbits and how they are moving. So the plasma in its current state that we're observing it. Um, for the REAF model, we used a uh, 2Z solar for the plasma generally because observations of red giants in the area have indicated a higher solar, uh, higher than solar abundance. But there has been some evidence looking at transients in the galactic center that there's iron depletion. And so part of this is also looking at the iron abundance because the iron feature is really the strongest feature that we get from the galactic, from Sag A star and Sag A east. So these are results from the hydrodynamical simulations where on the top row is uh, where we have a disk. The bottom row is where we don't have a disk. The left column is the column density. The middle is the X-ray intensity. And the right are these beautiful, but a bit complicated, just slightly plots, where you've got in each pixel, the color is determined by the line of sight, maximum line of sight velocity in that pixel. And then the white to gray, um, lay or, lay, uh, the white to gray is to indicate X-ray bright versus X-ray dim gas. And so that tells us that like gas here is very X-ray bright. Uh, gas here is very X-ray bright. And you can see that there are some differences between the top and the bottom, but it's not huge differences. So we can already see at this point that maybe we won't be able to tell any differences between the disk and notice scenarios. Um, I just wanted to mention that we were careful to choose like physically the correct plasma regions that correspond to the physical regions we were probing with different observations. And the moral of the story is that we cannot tell whether there's a disk or not uh, with Chandra and also with New Athena eventually I'll get to. The REAF fit that we did, we find that basically our results are consistent with previous results. We did not find anything wonderfully new because um, it was hard to constrain the REAF Q value. And basically the difference between the source and the background was very difficult. So we were fitting everything simultaneously and that led to making it different. It was difficult to constrain the temperature um, structure in this region. So when we compared the REAF model to the stellar winds model, these were the differences. And so in black is the Chandra data, in blue is the REAF, uh, model, and in red is the stellar winds model. And you can see that in the background regions, the stellar winds model is very much hotter. Um, and it's harder to see here, but the stellar winds model is slightly hotter than the REAF model in the source region as well. Between the extinction background instruments response, of course, the spectra lose a lot of their features, more than we were hoping for, but that's okay. Chandra is unable to discern between these scenarios. But what about New Athena? So the stellar wind plasma scenario is hotter overall than the REAF prediction. Uh, and part of the issue is that Chandra has a very low effective area, 6.97 keV. And so this is the generated new Athena predicted spectrum. Um, and the red again is the stellar winds and the dash versus solid is the difference between the disc and not having a disc. So like that's really not something we'll be able to differentiate. But um, here, Definitely, I think that the 6.97 keV line, um, looking at that with New Athena, we'd be able to differentiate between the stellar wind scenario and the REAF scenario. And so what does that actually mean? So when we're looking at the stellar wind scenario, we're looking at plasma that's based on just the stars that are there. There's no outflow from Sag A star that is included in this. There's a specific uh, cooling prescription based on abundances that are going into the stellar winds prediction. And so if the new Athena spectrum matches that much better, then there's something amiss with either the abundance or the temperature dependencies that we've been using for the REAF or we've been looking at for the REAF models. Whereas if the REAF fits better, then something is up with the stellar winds models as well. So that's the differentiation there. In summary, for the first portion of this talk, um, we fit the HETG spectrum with REAF and stellar winds model. We have mostly consistent with past results, but neither model can be ruled out. 
and new Athena will help us with constraining different plasma scenarios here. Now to supernova remnant SAG A East. Uh, supernova, so SAG A East is interesting for many reasons. It is next to a supermassive black hole and a bunch of other things, but also it's a mixed morphology supernova remnant, which is just a classification that tells us that it is uh, both center filled and shelled filled, which are two of the supernova remnant main classifications. Mixed morphology remnants tend to have an unequal element distribution. So on the left is W49B, and you can see that like the iron is very differently distributed than the other elements. MMSNRs also some have evidence of aura of over ionization and concentrated X-ray interiors. And at the stages that they're at, um, you might expect that just the rims are brighter, but you tend to have still a lot of X-ray emission in the center. And that's kind of what we see with SAGE East. On the right here is HB3, just to show that the like the yellow portion is very different morphologically in a different spot than the blue emission. We don't have uh, strong evidence of this unequal element distribution or anything in SAG A East because we don't currently have the resolution to do that, but I think that New Athena would help us with that. SAG A East is also, um, so I previously mentioned the puzzle of the young stars. SAG A East is also cool because, so this is a uh, diagram just showing the magnitudes of the stars near Sag A star, which is the cross, uh, the magnitudes of the stars nearby and where they are. And I think it is fairly reasonable to assume that Sag A East progenitor could have formed either when the other young stars in this cluster did or somewhat around there. And so Sag A East and its ejecta is kind of a record of the chemical conversation millions of years ago. And either way, uh, whether or not it's part of the cluster, it's insight insight into its progenitor tells us much more about the stars in the region. Previous analyses of SAG A East, um, a lot of them have uh, identified it as a core collapse. This paper from 2021 more recently claimed it could be a type 1a X supernova remnant, which includes like white dwarf deflagration. And um, they looked at the Chandra spectrum. And so they took this ellipse as their source region. They got rid of point sources. And this was the spectrum that they got. Um, and uh, as Laura mentioned at the beginning, I'm using sim signal separation techniques on the Chandra ACES imaging data to try and separate out the remnant to try and see if we can see those line ratios any better. Uh, but the Chandra data, while really good, um, still doesn't have as many counts as we would like to have really solid results in this region. So this is from work I've been doing recently. This is just a stacked 1.5 megaseconds of ACES I data. The top left is the 1, 1 to 2.6 keV. And you can see it's just this kind of plasma around SAG A star that you can see 2.6 to 3.5, and then there's 3.5 to 5. And then you really start to see that there's something here. Um, and in the six to seven KeV, so the iron feature, the strongest feature here, uh, we can see the pulsar wood nebula is bright and Sag J star is also there. And we have this shape uh, that is Sag J East, the center part of Sag J East. To put this into, I don't know if this is helpful or not because it's a bit confusing, but the, the point here is that the, the cyan contours again are the radio contours. The yellow contours here are the C and D, the ATN contours of the circumnuclear disk. And um, within that, you can maybe see that the this portion of the accretion flow, accretion flow, sorry, gas that is the plasma around Sag A star, it's not necessarily bound to it, but it seems to be kind of encased a little bit. It seems to be in a way constrained by the C and D. And um, I think New Athena can help. So. I did not have time or forethought to do like a detailed simulation here, but on the left is the Chandra 5 to 8 KEV data. And in the middle, I've just binned it to a factor of 10 to imitate the new Athena um, resolution. And you might think, Myra, that's much worse. However, this is what the CRISM, um, with this same format, um, this is what CRISM would look like. I am on the CRISM Galactic Center team, but I did not ask well enough in advance for the image. But I can confirm that there is no structure in the image uh, while the spectrum is beautiful. 
And so I think that with New Athena, we would get this very, very high spectral resolution that would allow us to get line ratios and specifically line ratios within like 6.5 to 6.8 keV, because now we get like one line from Chandra. And if we had better ratios of the like recombination lines, we and sorry, if we had line ratios and spatially resolved line ratios, like in different portions of this remnant, I feel like we would learn a lot about Sage East. Also, we would be able to do a kind of spatially resolved analysis of the gas around Sag A star that's kind of confined within the CND. Um, I don't have a slide for it, but recent simulations have shown that maybe the Sag A West spiral is like in spiraling gas from the CND. And um, I think all of these are kind of like open questions that we would um, be able to probe better when we have new Athena. So overall, um, new Athena will help us because it can distinguish between plasma scenarios around Sag A star. And this has ties to other low luminosity AGN and understanding them, and also the abundances in general in the plasma of the galactic center. Also, spatially resolved analyses of Sag A East, I think would be really cool. And I think looking at those line ratios would be able to help us better identify what kind of remnant it is and what kind of progenitor it came from. And lastly, we could maybe look at 3D dynamics of the gas that's kind of constrained by the CND near Sag A star and learn more about that. And with that, I've got my email here if you have any lingering questions after this or if you want to get in touch or anything. And thank you again so much for having me. Awesome. Thank you very much, Mayura. Very, uh, very interesting presentation. Um, I will now open the field up to questions. Iliak, I see your hand up. Hi, Mayura. Thank you very much for this uh, very nice presentation. I had a question regarding the first part of your talk, uh, and in particular, the one regarding like um, the formation of this uh, of this disk around the black hole. So you mentioned the presence of an uh, extended H-alpha disk, but you also say that Chandra won't be able to distinguish uh, between the simulations with the disk or without the disk. Yes. Um, so do we do we agree that if a disk forms at a certain scale, it should diffuse inward all the way up to the immediate vicinity of the black hole? Isn't it something you can, I mean, cannot, can't you relate like the HD uh, images at some point to, um, to what we see at bigger scale, like this H-alpha disk you mentioned? What's the dimension of this H-alpha disk, for instance? So the H-alpha disk um, is suggested to be about 0 0.2 arc seconds wide. So um, on the scale so of... In RG, it's like how many RG? No, that's... Uh... Uh, 10 to 3-ish RG, I believe. Okay. Cool. Yeah, so it's still much further out than the EHT. Um, and I think the... It's still debated kind of whether the disk is there um, fully because there are also... look uh, People have also looked at like the bracket gamma emission. And... Um, but I don't... I think, yeah, it's a very good point. You're saying that the disk should extend far in enough that we see other signatures of it. Is that, am I understanding that right? Mm, yeah, well, that's my that's my gut feeling. I don't have like nice simulations like this, but like uh, I feel like if the disk forms at a certain distance, it should somewhat diffuse inward. Mm -hmm. So one thing I can say is that the simulations do show that even uh, when the disk forms in the simulations, it is pretty transient because there's so much happening. It can be very easily disrupted by movements um, from the stars and all of that. And the simulations don't take into account other things like the effect possibly of the CND or the effect of um, any kind of uh, supernovae that may go off. And so, uh, yeah, so I don't have a, a good response really, but I don't think that it would extend all the way far into where we would see it with the HD, but um, yeah. 
And in terms of orientation of the disk, I mean, uh, if we see like this um, Doppler shift, I guess it's pretty edge on, but the spin axis of Sagittarius A star has been claimed to be pretty face on. Yes. So the disk is not super aligned with what we might expect from Sag A star. The simulations, uh, Diego's simulations, produce a disk that is kind of off axis from the disk. So that's part of why I was mentioning that we don't take into account the CND and other structures in the area that might change the momentum, angular momentum axis of the disk. Uh, what is interesting about the galactic center in this area is that the disks, the star, the disks with stars um, are at different orientations from the galaxy and from Sag A star. So it's definitely, there's some stuff happening where this wouldn't be the only thing off axis is my point. Okay, thank you very much. Hey, do we have any other questions for Mayra? Oh, I see Chiro has written something in the chat. Chiro, do you want to go ahead and ask a question? Yes, sure. Uh, I was very interested uh, by the work and the simulations with Athena. Uh, I was wondering if you think the statistics in the Iron K lines may be good enough to search for light echoes. Uh, you know, time delays between um, kind of light curve of spectral lines, or the light curve in very tiny energy band, as, as is, for example, is done for molecular clouds. Do you think there is a, this chance? Like within a given molecular cloud, like the lag, or over a uh, large region, the molecular clouds? Uh, um, time lag between spectral line measured in different area of the simulation uh, you did for Athena and uh, in, in the last plot. In the last plot. Uh, there was this last plot with uh, the, the map of the source with uh, Athena. Yeah, either this or the previous one. So do you think the statistics might be good enough so that you can search for light echoes between different areas? I definitely think we can. I'm very hesitant to answer this question, knowing that Gabriella Ponti is on this call. Um, but I'm fairly certain that um, using new Athena would give us really, really high signal on those iron K alpha fluorescence lines that we get from the molecular clouds. Mm -hmm. And it definitely has the resolution that we would be able to look at um, different regions of the molecular cloud and map it that way, I believe. Okay. And perhaps also to distinguish between areas of uh, thermal heating, because if you're heating, you might have some photoionization lines on top of the collisionally ionized lines. I guess perhaps the statistic will be good enough. Yeah, that's a great question. I am not entirely sure. I think that, you know, uh, running it through like 60 or something would be required to get more of an idea on if we would get that kind of signal. I think that um, I know that like with CRISM, uh, we have almost, we have really good signal and we are able to at least confirm or exclude certain photoionization scenarios and such. So I think I am hopeful for that for sure. Thank you very much. Okay, anybody else, other questions? Oh, I actually had a question. It was kind of coming to my mind following on to what Chiro was asking. Mayara, if someone came to you and said, hey, you've got unlimited time on New Athena, design us the ideal observing campaign for Sag A star and to, to explore all these regions and these science questions, what would you design? What would be your observing proposal? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I think I would try to look at, uh, let me see if I can, uh, yeah, let me just pull this up. That's not what I want. The point is um, that, so in the galactic center, we've got emission from Sag A star and Sag A east. There's also like this galactic diffuse emission that we have going on. And so I feel like I would want to look at the Sag A accretion flow, of course, and Sag A east, but I think I would also take pointings kind of a bit further away where there's as few point sources as possible and try and identify like line ratios in that and see if we can use that to trace any of previous Sag A star activity in any way um, to as look at, you know, for signatures of photoionization in things that are um, not molecular clouds, I guess, is what I think would be an interesting thing that we, I don't think, have been really able to do. We don't, haven't had the signal to do, but I could be wrong. Interesting. Okay. Sounds good. 
Carlotta, I see your hand up. Yes, thank you. Sorry, I connected a little bit later, so maybe you have uh, sp spoken about this, but uh, what about polarization from that region? Do you think that something can help in conjunction with Latina? Data? So I know that um, we've got polarization measurements really, really close to SAG star, closer in, so like 100 RG. Um, I know that we've got polarization measurements of um, uh, material further away out that has told us that Sagittarius star was active in the recent past. I don't think, I don't think that polarization measurements at the scale of like the Bondi radius would be super help. I don't know if there would be a polarization signal that would be strong, I guess is my point. Um, I think that the signal, um, would need to have, sorry. Uh, I think that closer in, you would have stronger magnetic fields and um, further out, they're looking at molecular clouds, stronger magnetic fields. But I don't think with the diffuse uh, nature of the plasma that the polarization signal would be very strong. But of course, if there was polarization, that would very much help with understanding the dynamics that we see. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, I didn't, don't quite have an answer. Okay, any other questions for Mayra? Going once, going twice. Okay, well, hearing none, Mayra, thank you again for this wonderful talk. This is fabulous. Thank you so much. Excellent work. And I wanted to remind our audience that the next webinar will be on Thursday, November 7th, at which point we will hear from Didier Beret on deep learning for fitting X-ray spectra. So thank you all for your attendance and enjoy the rest of your day.